is our final panel. This is exciting. We've had some amazing panels. Do you agree? Yeah. So, I am very, very white. <laughs> and uh, have already this weekend proven that in a lot of ways. Um, these people are not, and we're going to hear from them. So, I'm not going to talk much. I would like you guys to please introduce yourselves and tell us where you find yourself on the LGBTQ spectrum, what word you use to describe yourself, as well as how you would describe your cultural, ethnic background. So whatever order you want. Hey y'all, um, my name is Gabrielle, and I think that um, just kind of pondering like where I fall on the spectrum um, has been difficult because um, I'm not super big on labels. I just uh, want to do what I'm going to do. But I do acknowledge that um, these things help us to understand our world when we have some way of, um, of putting some one somewhere in order to kind of understand. So I would say that queer is kind of a good, a good way to say I'm not straight. Like, that's, that's kind of basically points. But then, you know, Jason exists. Now you're going to wonder which Jason. <laughs> so I'm American Black, um, which kind of basically means that I don't have a history. Um, we, don't, we don't have a I, I, would, I would say that I'm a, a woman without a country because uh, America is, is not, I would say, my country. I think it's a place that I was born, a place where my ancestors lived, um, but we are a displaced people. So um, I really kind of move around the states as um, someone who's displaced with no true history. Irish and Aboriginal Canadian, so I'm um, Métis, and uh, that's me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Laura. I identify as bisexual, but I tend to say I'm mostly attracted to women, but I also read Jason's, um, what he said about like the definition of bisexual, so I do identify with that. Um, I'm born from Colombia, South America. Um, I do have a French last name, which I think plays a role. So, but I'm really afraid about that. Yeah. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Billy. Um, I used to most of my life identify as queer, but as of about a year ago, when I was adopted and initiated into the Anishinaabe Nation, uh, my cocoons basically said, "Hey Billy, yeah, you identify as queer, but now." must identify as two-spirited, so, so that's how I identify myself. Yeah. Um, I am Canadian, <laughs> um, and I am second generation mixed Korean and Greek, so mother is Korean, father is Greek. And second gen, because uh, I want to mention that because they are both immigrants uh, as well to uh, the country. First question. That's a real question for you to think about really hard. How has being a person of color impacted your coming out experience and your sense of place in the LGBTQ community? Who wants to start us out? So this is one of those questions that you know, I'll be thinking about all day today and thinking about how I could have better answered it. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that, um, it, I, I think I haven't really thought about myself as a queer person until like the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. So, so I mostly thought about myself as someone who was radically different from the people around me. And I grew up in Wisconsin in a really rich white mm -hmm. suburb. So I've always been the other. 
So I'm pretty comfortable in that place. Um, and mostly because um, growing up, you know, I truly thought this. I thought everyone around me, they were idiots. <laughs> and that helped. Um, <laughs> and, and to be quite frank, you know, I'm not actually really out. Um, I am with you all, and I, I feel comfortable being here in this space with you guys. Um, but that's kind of a part of my really grappling with all the things uh, that, that I can't ignore. You know, I was like, God. I think I'm going to keep falling in love with women. This is a problem. <laughs> um, so, I, so I'm not sure that I'm, like, I'm not publicly out. My, my family knows. Um, my immediate family, and we're still, like, working through stuff. I'm not out publicly. Like, I, even when I post pictures online, you know, I'm kind of careful. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, have you only your profile picture of your dating her? You know, the ones who do know, I'm like, no. If I'm dating someone, you'll never see their picture. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure that like how being a person of color um, interacts with that. Like I feel like in my life, the parts of me are very, like the big parts of me are very separate. Um, you know, I'm a football player, and a lot of my teammates don't know that I'm a musician because when I come to football practice, I'm a football player, and um, I'm not there to make friends. I'm there to play football. You know, I'm very like, all right, let's go. We get now. We got back. Time to chit chat, you know, flirt. <laughs> so I think I'm so compartmentalized in so many aspects of my life that I never think about the intersectionality of being queer and uh, being a person of color. Like, kind of ever. I think what's most salient to people is my brown skin. So I'm, I'm very much aware um, in the states that people react to my skin first, and then. The mohawk, <laughs> resting bitch face. <laughs> um, and then, you know, maybe if we could get past that and they find out that I'm just, you know, I love babies. And, <laughs> so, and then they're like, okay, you know, you're, you're one of those. Um, so I think, I think it's hard to kind of get to the, to the queer part because I'm not really sure that I've figured it out. So how has it impacted my experience. Um, well, I have um, more recently come out and um, when I was deciding to tell people, I told my, um, my Canadian family first. And so my parents are split. My dad is the Canadian, he's the white one, my mom's the Jamaican. And I was like immediately like telling dad and like that side of the family first so they knew like almost like a year ahead of the rest of my family and I just told my uh, Caribbean family over the holidays and it was something that like I kind of did like dragging my feet because of how <coughs> homosexuals are talked about in the Jamaican community it's like um, when the conversation was being had and the comments that you get it's it's almost like when I decided to embrace this queer part of myself, it was like I was denying my whole like Jamaican side. And for them, it's like it's not it's not separate. It's like in Jamaica, there is there, you, you're not queer. So if you're saying that you're queer, you're saying you're not Jamaican. And so like for me, it was just like. Yeah, because it's like, it was frustrating because it's like, I, I still am me, and I still have that part of me, and they're denying that, and I have to deny another part of me if I want to be a part of the, so it's just like that, like that weird tension and that mixture of all of that, that was a complication and something that made me very reluctant, and a lot of my family have, um, they, they have terms for, for me and for us, and you know, that doesn't, that doesn't feel good coming from family but mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah my coming out experience was yeah like in Colombian or Hispanic Latino culture it's, it's already something they joke about and things like that and then also you add the Christian thing to it too which then it's like two things telling you that you shouldn't or you, you can't um, so coming out to my parents has been like they've been very loving. 
Um, but I guess the big thing now, it's like they were okay and we talked about it, but now that I do have a girlfriend, then we finally like step back and we were like, I think they're actually trying to figure it out now that they see it. And I think a big thing, like, for me, is like, I did tell them I'm mostly attracted to women, so they have still that hope of you, you're gonna meet a man. <laughs> right? um, so, yeah, it's, uh, there was another part to the question. Um, yeah, but you don't have to answer that yet, it'll come to this. Okay. But Lara, just, you talked to me a little bit about how your parents have trouble finding resources. Do you want to talk about oh, that too? Yeah. Um, yeah, so like my dad, when I came out to him, he's he's more comfortable with English and things like that. So he did come to a few events, camp house and things like that. So he was able to talk to people. <laughs> um, so I, that was really good. But my mom, I feel like she hasn't been able to talk to him. Like, she doesn't feel comfortable with English, so she's not able to come here. Um, and then I give her permission to talk to a friend about it, but then she's like, I'm, she's afraid that they're gonna judge me because they know me, right? So um, I give her permission anyways, but, so I feel like she hasn't been able to talk to anyone. And then if I go and like find, try and find sources online, like you can find anything on the internet, but to find like a more generous space, Spanish, <laughs> it's really, I haven't found anything. Yeah. So, if anyone finds anything. Translators out there? Anyone? <laughs> so, yeah, I feel my mom doesn't, yeah, like, it's more too, like, do they want to come? But then, if she does want to, she doesn't have the source. Yeah. So, that's the goal. Um, it's interesting. I haven't had a really dramatic coming out because I feel like ever since I was little I was coming out about something. <laughs> and I, if that be uh, just being a visual, not just visual minority, but visual anomaly, like even in kindergarten being asked, like I was this like little possibly boy with that typical Asian bowl cut <laughs> and looked very androgynous, right? So even my classmates would always say, um, are you a boy or a girl? <laughs> or like they would say attendance, Billy Gekas, right? And I put up my hand. And they were like, second, just looking at me for a moment. I'm like, Billy Gekas. Right? Like, yeah. <laughs> As a little kid, I guess I had to be a little sassy and <laughs> a little bit of attitude. <laughs> and then it turned into um, a little older, do you like boys or do you like girls, right? And, and I, I'm like, oh, at that age, being young, I'm like, I like everybody, right? Not sexualized in a sense or matured in that way. And then a little early, older, do you like penises or vaginas? <laughs> and then both, <laughs> really. And um, so it's like, again, coming out in stages uh, but then for me it's funny because I didn't when it comes to sexuality and gender that wasn't the hardest part for me because uh, I have a very supportive community and yeah there's challenges and um, I'll share about my mom in a moment but it was more my me being a visual minority and my ethnicity being Korean and Greek and people not knowing how to compartmentalize me and really the racism and prejudice that have come along with it. And even as an elementary school kid, one of my uh, stories I like to share is, again, an attendance, saying my name being called William John Gekas, right? And they're putting my, my hand up, and, so, and the supply teacher, not the regular teacher, but the supply teacher says, just basically looks at me and turns their eyes, saying, and repeats my name, William John Gekas, where are you? And I'm like, um, I'm here. He goes, stop causing trouble in the class. You're lying. Uh, who is William John Gekas? That's not your name. Because Gekas is a Greek last name, and I was visu visibly Asian. And I basically said, that is my name, and started raising my voice. And they're like, you better get out of this room for being insolent. And I basically shouted at them, saying, I don't give a damn what you think. <laughs> Slam 
the door so hard, not intentionally doing it so hard, but I had so much anger, and I just busted out in tears and wailed in the, in the hallway. So, yeah, um, coming out constantly. <coughs> and I really do believe um, also within the spectrum, LGBTQ uh, plus, plus, plus spectrum, that when it comes to race, it plays a huge deal. Uh, and, and I think that's why we have this panel and the dialogues that are going around. And it's about creating awareness and how to build those bridges generously with grace and compassion. And we're all here to learn that and to exercise that. Yeah. What aspects of your life as a person of color do you think that the average white LGBTQ person might not be aware of? Very quickly, we did a great exercise, thank you, Eric, on privilege. Mm -hmm. It's privilege, privilege, privilege. Mm -hmm. Awareness, not judgment. Just privilege and awareness of how to work with that. And, and to recognize that all of us, every single one of us, I believe, do exercise what's called microaggressions, mm -hmm. right? And the reason why the microaggressions is because they're unconscious. And, and then how do we bring consciousness do you want to give an example? Um, I love your hair, <laughs> right? Like, how, like, what do you do with your hair? You know, like, how, do you keep, how do you keep your hair the way you do? Like, I, is there some way I can have my hair right here? It's so, it's so exotic. I love it. It's, it's so exotic. Can I touch it? <laughs> right there. So again. You know, you, you're feeling like you mean well because you feel like you're affirming some beauty or aesthetic, but really the underlying premise is your relationship because it's an other, especially the language of being exotic or something other. It's not, again an othering of the person. So any othering of the person um, with a, some, a list of assumptions that are unconscious, that can that, that's a form of microaggression. But like sometimes it's those keywords like exotic and uh, yeah, but that was good. The keywords. <laughs> you know, I think I think being a, a a brown woman in the states. You know, when I was a teenager, it's like it's the worst thing to be a brown person in the states. It's just the worst. Yeah. Um, being a brown woman, it's even worse. So. Um, so during my teenage years, I'd say I was pretty asexual, but I was very aware that white boys weren't uh, attracted to me um, outside of, I was, I'm a really great athlete, so I was always picked first for um, any, any game we were playing um, over any of those boys. <laughs> and, uh, but I was aware, like I, I would watch the girls around me, I was like, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. That's stupid. Um, and so I think, that what I would, so I think I, I, I just learned that like, people interact with my skin color first. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I had a really, really, really great conversation last night talking about privilege and how even though like you can have a head knowledge of like, um, you know, awareness and you have privilege, sometimes like for, for, you know, cis white guys, there's still, I think a dissonance there like, but but how am I, how do I have privilege if I still have difficulties that I go through and I'm really trying to be supportive? Um, and I would say, and Eric, amazing exercise last night. I think that was a really great way to kind of sum up like, all right, well, you had $100, you had $2,800. Um, and I think it, it really just comes down to, do you know that, I can never pass as anything other than brown. Mm -hmm. So there's no dressing a certain way, adjusting my speech. I'm always going to be a brown woman, and that's always going to be dangerous, stressful, anxiety producing. Um, there's no getting out of the skin. Right, at all. Right. Um, and, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't want to be, but just the, the, the fact that I am forced to closet certain parts of myself for the sake of survival. So I can never be um, closeted as a brown woman. But I can choose to not tell people about being queer because I can only fight 
one fire at a time. And like, you know, a lot of it is about just staying alive. Yeah. So. Um, I think that one thing that is, um, that was kind of a, like a point of tension for me was the, like really, um, like seeing myself when I was, when I was, at, so I grew up in rural Ontario in a very small town just outside of Peterborough and um, I, I was raised by my father, so my Canadian father um, and I remember as a kid um, my grandmother who was lovely and she actually gave me those pink pants that I wore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my grandma, she rocked them back in the day. Um, so my wonderful grandmother, when I was young, I remember she would, she, for Christmas, I got Barbie dolls. And I remember getting these Barbie dolls, and like all of my friends had the Barbie dolls, so I was like super stoked about getting the Barbie dolls. And I'm playing with the Barbie dolls, and I'm brushing their hair. And I'm looking at their beautiful hair, and my hair in comparison, and I just wanted all of the, like, I know I, I'm, like I'm grown now and like it's like I, I, I appreciate the diversity of my hair. But back then when I'm living in small town Ontario with all these white girls that have beautiful hair and I have this afro mullet that my dad does not know how to take care of. And he's taking me to Zellers to get my hair cut. And it was just a mess of a time. And I'm looking at this Barbie doll, and I look at myself in the mirror, and it would, they're just like the not seeing myself represented um, in that space. And then when I'm transitioning and when I'm coming out and having and looking around the community, and this has been this community has been life for my partner and I, and we're so thankful, like beyond thankful for the friendships and the support. Um, but then not really seeing a lot of faces that look like, you know, again, not seeing faces that look like mine and just wondering like, you know, it just, it feels nice when people that look like and have a similar experience are given voice. So then I can say like, okay, I, I, I do fit. I'm not, this is a place of belonging. And so like spaces like this are incredible and in seeing the, um, the effort that the community is going to just to make space, it means so much. It means so much for some people. Uh, yeah, so for me a lot of it has been like the, well the main thing is I had this conversation with a girl and she's from, she has like Egyptian background but she, she looks white and she was talking about how she didn't have privilege, and but she added in like she's lesbian, she's this, this, and I was like, yeah, that's true. But if you're walking through an airport, and like all you see right over, like you're not gonna say anything, you're not, they're gonna see you, and you're white. Like you don't have to. Yes, maybe once it comes to more conversation stuff, yes, there's added other things added, but like, yeah, we're like talking about the first handoff thing, so. Um, so for me, um, one of the big things was like Latina, it's like, you say that, I had, I guess I've had a lot more experience with like, going, I do like dancing salsa, <laughs> yeah. so going dancing and then like, there is the Latina girl there, ooh, like, you know, so you get a little bit of that, like, and yeah, like the assumptions they have for you, even though they could be positive, mm -hmm. like, you like coffee, you know, like, <laughs> who cares, like, but still, like, they make those assumptions, and, yeah, like, I actually didn't used to like coffee, I do like it now, so it's like, sometimes I do roll my eyes, like, yes, I do, but at the same time, it's like, just, yeah, like, don't make those assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's just kind of the exotic, kind of, kind of, you know, the objectify you, mm -hmm. but as a, in the race, you know, mm -hmm. um, not only um, like your body and stuff like that, but also like the idea that you can roll your R's and you see mm -hmm. that, like, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the assumptions and the thing like that. Yeah. It's been interesting that I did this <laughs> because I feel I put myself in 
<coughs> to another place where they can judge me or they can make more assumptions of me. So there has been a few times on like, <laughs> there was one day I came to Toronto um, and then I was driving, I actually had my phone and stuff. So they died. And so I'm like, I actually got out of the car and tried and find someone. So there was someone by Tim Hortons and I'm like, walking towards him, he's smoking, <laughs> and he's like, I don't have anything, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not looking for anything, <laughs> like, <laughs> so they already, like, make assumptions of you, so it's like, it's been interesting, because I can just cut it off, and, like, that's not there anymore, people won't make those assumptions of me, and so, it's interesting that I put myself there. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So we only have a couple minutes left, but we like to get a little bit more um, dangerous and personal in this last one in terms of our community. So it's already been mentioned that, Heather, that you don't see a lot of people like yourself here, right? So at our retreat, I was counting, I think, out of the 140 people who registered, I think there were maybe 30 who could identify as people of color. So still a pretty white community. Um, so how do you think that our community could better embrace people of color? Could better, are there ways that we're still erasing your experience, even in the generous space community? Are there ways that we're whitewashing? How can we improve? And maybe if just a couple of you wanna comment on that. My biggest thing um, in any majority white space, which is, Oh, everything um, <laughs> is that I need to see people who look like me on staff in positions of leadership um, as workshop leads as break like it would be nice to um, to see that in staff honestly mm -hmm. because um, y'all are the ones kind of like spearheading um, and I would say that across the board in in churches and schools um, and that was on the privilege thing, right? Like, I'd, I'd love to see someone who looks like me, even if it was a straight ally who was a brown woman, that'd be a win yeah. um, for me because I'm equal parts brown as I am queer, you know? Um, and, I, and I realized that you, you all do so much to make sure every voice is, is, is represented. And that's important, and I think even the exercise showed us in our group that the voice of someone who had physical challenges or was disabled in some way was missing from our group, and so we kind of skipped yeah. over that. And it's um, it just made it so clear to me why it's so important that we are seeking out a diversity of voice um, so that we can make sure uh, that we are really um, backing up our claim to, to want to have space for everyone here who desires it. Um, also, I think that there is probably a desire for people of color to be at these mm -hmm. places, but there are probably very real barriers yeah. mm -hmm. to that. Like, um, I have a car, I have time, I have some money, um, <laughs> very little, <laughs> and I have an ability to be like, hey, I'm taking off work, mm -hmm. you can fire me if you want, I don't care. This is a part of my self-care. Yeah. I, so I think there are like certain barriers, maybe location. Um, we're also like out in nature, y'all. Like, this is, this is nature. <laughs> I'd have to go with a professional camper to survive. I can maybe set up a tent, maybe, but I don't know. I'm good at sleeping in them. Uh, to the camp out. Yeah. <laughs> I used to be there a year ago, so don't worry. Is that a thing? Is that a thing? Like a camp out? Yeah. Yeah. It's a white person. Lots of professional campers. <laughs> I, can, I can learn. Um, but I think like going into places where there will be uh, people of color and um, really trying to build strong connections because I think the, the, the brown queer community is a little bit segregated from the, the greater majority, and we do talk about it. Um, a lot of times when we're talking about like uh, queer feminist theory, we're, we talk about the fact that it's from a, a, a white woman's perspective, and that's what we think when we think feminism and the critique of it, but where are the brown voices? So 
I think that that's kind of what we think in, like, towards the whole queer community yeah. is that, like, we'll do our own thing. Um, yeah. So I think maybe being intentional about finding out where are people of color in the queer community and saying, hey, can we can we all be one big table instead of, like, so. Yeah. It ta I think it takes concerted effort and maybe have ambassadors that are people of color mm -hmm. to, like, yeah. I'll try to bring some people from the States. Please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really quick comment. Really quick. Um, I would just say listening and asking questions. Um, like, the dialogue that was started even in my little circle of friends from last night was fantastic. Like there was just like a friend asked, um, you know, after that privilege conversation and just like, what's your experience been? Because they're not, they're not, um, they don't have this outlook of being like prejudiced anyway. They just see like people and people, and, but like our experience is different. So just asking and listening, I think that's huge. It just like makes, um, it was very valuable for me and it made me feel like seen, heard, Thing. Visibility is is the main issue. Visibility, your skin carries history. Doesn't matter ideologically what you want to believe or justify. Somebody's judgments with what they see is going to be how they uh, act upon you. So providing a safe space for those who are not privileged because of visibility mm -hmm. to have space to voice. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for giving us. Space to voice, and then there's a workshop coming up right after. So, let's give them a hand, guys. <laughs>